We can have good conversations and arguments about religion without killing each other. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director. There are thousands of religions out there. So why think that Christianity is the right one? And why Catholic Christianity in particular? That's what I'm going to be asking Bishop Barron today, who joins us from his own diocese of Winona, Rochester. Bishop, good to see you. Hey, Brandon. Always good to see you. We're recording this in mid-December, but I think it's not going to air until February, which means you either just went on or you're about to go on mm -hmm. your big trip to London. Maybe anticipate that for us. Tell us what it's going to be like. It was a trip we were supposed to make back in September, and literally the night before we were supposed to go up to England, uh, the Queen died. And so the trip was called off and it was postponed until February. Um, it's involving a mass at um, Westminster Cathedral, which I'm looking forward to immensely. Uh, it's going to involve a talk at Parliament to, I think it's Catholic members, but anyone's invited and the talk will be at Parliament. It'll involve a major uh, kind of jamboree uh, day for Catholics there. I think a meeting with Word on Fire Institute members who are in the UK. Um, a trip to Thomas More's um, cell at the Tower of London, so I'm super excited about it. And it'll be, and it won't be tropical weather, but probably a little better than Minnesota weather to spend a week in London. I remember last time we recorded this podcast, you said it was sunny and three degrees. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's midwinter in in southern Minnesota. <laughs> Well, you've done a couple of these Reddit AMAs now. Reddit mm -hmm. uh, has these types of interactions called AMAs, Ask Me Anything, where a well-known uh, person comes on and says, ask me anything. And anybody can leave comments asking them questions. We've covered those here on the podcast before, looking at some of the trends and popular questions people ask. But one of them that in both times was near the very top. It got the most upvotes. Many people were interested in, in the question was something like, why are you so confident that of all the religions and the history of the world, you just happen to have chosen the right one? Um, now, I know we've discussed this before at, at in small bits, but I, I thought we'd devote a whole episode to it, unpacking it in more detail. So let me start off by just asking you that question directly to get your answer to it. Um, you're a Christian. You're a Catholic Christian in particular. Do you think Catholic Christianity is the one true religion? And if so, why? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> and, you know, Brandon, in a way, my John Henry Newman side will come out here. To answer a question like that adequately, you have to take into account the illative sense. So Newman says when you assent to something, it's very rarely on the basis of like a clinching argument. Like, oh, got it, you know. Relatively simple things you can show with that kind of, you know, intellectual rigor. Usually it's a combination of all kinds of elements, right? It's reason, it's experience, it's the witness of saints, it's, it's the sacraments, it's looking at Notre Dame Cathedral, it's, uh, it's hunch, it's intuition, it's a whole range of things. Our friend Chesterton, you'll know the line better than I is, and he say like, why'd you become a Catholic? And he said, well, there are a thousand reasons, but all adding up to... It's true. And I think he's reflecting the Newman instinct there that, you know, to say, here's the clinching argument why I am I think Catholicism is the right religion. Uh, so that's a, a first observation. Uh, let me also um, illuminate it this way. You can, with reason, show that many of the tenets of Catholic Christianity are correct, are rationally defensible. So it's not simply a matter of uh, an arbitrary choice or like you got your hobby, I've got mine, you know, or your favorite color is blue, mine's green. Um, no, you can show in a rationally compelling way using philosophy, using reason, that many of the tenets of Catholic Christianity are true. So Thomas Aquinas called these the preambula fidei, the preambles to the faith. And they include the existence of God, God's uh, infinity, God's omnipotence, uh, the existence of the soul. We can go through a whole slew of things that can be demonstrated through reason. So you say, hey, you're convinced this is right. To some degree, I can say, yeah, let me show you. Let me demonstrate to you why I think this is the case. So it's not just an arbitrary thing. But here's the second observation there. 
we say reason and faith. So the claim of Catholic Christianity is that God, whose existence I think can be known through reason, God has revealed to us, not just in many and fragmentary ways, but in the fullness of time, according to the letter to the Hebrews now, in the fullness of time, he's spoken to us through his Son, which means through his Logos, through his Word, so that God, in an unsurpassably efficacious way, has spoken himself in Christ Jesus. Moreover, in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, Jesus claimed to be the Logos, to be uh, divine, was ratified. I think when you take all that into consideration, you say, well, there is something that's unsurpassable, therefore, about the revelation contained uh, in, in Christianity. So again, I'm speaking kind of very broadly here. Adequately to answer that question, we'd have to invoke the illative sense and say, for all these different reasons and many others that are probably unconscious to me, I've come to this uh, ascent. But I, I want to avoid the implication that's that's behind the critique that you're alluding to, that it's just a matter of, you know, a uh, happy accident or, well, yeah, I was born in, in a Christian country, so of course I'm a Christian and I just have my little hobby, you have yours. Well, no, no, there's a, there's a rational integrity to it that can be shown. I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here, and I'm, I'm trying yeah. to use the language that I've seen uh, critics and questioners voice to you. Yeah. They often use the language of the one true religion. So you think yeah. Catholic Christianity is the one true religion. The implication seems to be that every other religion is false. So right. let me ask you, what's your view of other religions in that case? Yeah, well, my view is that of Vatican II, and Vatican II was not a great novelty there. It reflects, uh, you know, moves within the great tradition. Namely, that in, in all the great religious traditions and religious philosophies and so on, you can find elements of truth. You can find uh, truth to some degree. You can find rays of light, you know, and that seems obvious to me. I mean, there's no religious tradition. There are a lot of, let's say, silly, fringe sort of, you know, religious expressions. But think of the mainstream religious expressions in, in uh, the human race. If, if there was nothing true in them, there was nothing good or beautiful or valuable, they would never have survived. They would never have fed people for so long. So the church, I think, very gratefully acknowledges these, these facts. But the fullness of truth, the fullness of it, in that sense, the one true religion, it doesn't mean all the other ones are simply false. It means they're, um, they participate in the truth to a lesser degree. Now, let me, let me give an analogy for this, maybe. So, do you remember that scene in the beginning of Goodwill Hunting, the famous film where the professor at MIT puts this complex formula or equation or something, problem on the, on the board, and he challenges the students, you know, can anyone solve this? And the students all try in different ways, and, the, you know, the star of the movie solves it. But my point is this. Is there one correct answer to that problem? Well, yeah, there is. There's, there's one perfectly correct, adequate answer. But might a professor at MIT, or to bring it down to grade school math if you want, might a professor say, yeah, the answer you gave, that's not correct, but it's, it's close. It's, it's getting there. You've got a, you did a lot of it correctly, you know? And then another one, yeah, it, it, that's good and that's good, but no, you see how you're falling short of, of the full answer. And then maybe there's some that, no, no, that's just ridiculous. No, no, you're not even in the ballpark. You're not, you're not even close to solving it. Or maybe some never even tried, <laughs> you know? My point is, you can say there's the one correct answer. Yeah, that's right. But you don't have to, therefore, simply denigrate every other answer. You can say, no, to varying degrees, they approach the, the fullness of the correct answer. Now, let me just stay with that analogy because it helps me a little bit. So there I'm looking at, okay, major problem and finding the solution. That's putting the stress all on, on us, that we're going to strive to figure this out, and some get it and some don't, right? But let's suppose the guy that writes the equation for you and, and watches as you, as you try to solve it, at some point gives you the answer and says, 
no, this is actually the answer. And I, I realize that you're, none of you is really going to get this completely right. And I now want to reveal the answer to you. And I'm the one who posed the problem. So I, I, I know the solution to it, and I want to give it to you. Now we're getting into the realm of faith as opposed to mere reason. If the puzzle is, let's say, human life, you know, the meaning of it all, or whatever you want to say, that's the puzzle, that's the, that's the, the conundrum. And we're all striving to figure it out. And some are getting closer than others, right? But then in the fullness of time, the one who gave us the conundrum also deigned to give us the answer to it, revealed to us the answer. Well, then I would say, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the right answer, you know? Uh, and that would be, the, that's the one true answer was, was given to me by the one who originally posed the conundrum. Now we're getting in the ballpark of what we mean by a revealed religion accepted in faith. You know, now once that answer is given, can I strive to understand it more fully using my reason? Of course, that's called theology, right? Now, fides querens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. So, once the answer was given, maybe it's like I, I'm not really bright enough to really see why that's the answer. But now, having studied it more, ah, ah, now I now I get it. Now I see why. Yes, that is the answer. See what I'm doing here, Brandon, in a way I'm, I'm trying to just get at this thing from different angles because it's, in a way, a notoriously complex problem. There isn't like a, a neat single argument that, that sums it up, but there's different ways of approaching this problem. You've highlighted before how in religion there seems to be a unique hesitancy to land on one definitive position and yeah. say, this is the right one. You know, you mm -hmm. don't see that in, let's say, economics or politics where people yeah. are very eager to say, right. this is the right path, that's the wrong path. But when yeah. it comes to religion, in your AMAs, I know you got accused often of being arrogant for thinking yeah, right. you have the one right. right religion. Is it arrogant to think that? No, and stay with your analogy, which I like, of politics. So we, we've math and coming to different, you know, answers. Look at politics. Now, our country is not as clear because we only have two major parties. But let's say go to a country like, like uh, the UK, a parliamentary system where there's like a whole slew of parties. And let's say you are a Tory, you're a, a mainstream conservative, and you say without hesitation, yeah, this is the right party to be in. This, this is the right best way to get at all these problems that face our society. Okay. Then you look at other parties and you say, yeah, there's there's some that are kind of close to my position, but you know, we differ on X, Y, and Z. But they're, you know, pretty close. Then there's people over there. No, I think they're they're way off. That's not correct at all. And then the people on the way far left and the way far right, they're both crazy. No, no, nothing to do with them. Well, we make those judgments all the time. All the time. And and no one hesitates to say, Yeah, I've got after careful consideration, after living life a little bit and trying different things and listening to a wide variety of perspectives, I now say, yeah, I, I want to be a conservative uh, party member. And I can say, you're relatively right. You're relatively wrong. You're really wrong. And so are you. Okay, we do it in politics. Why wouldn't we do it in religion? Now, I know what the answer is, and it's true of politics too to some degree, but you know, the terrible history we have of religious violence. So I get it, you know, that, that we should always be uh, prudent and, and charitable when talking about what's of ultimate concern. So if I would just, in a cavalier way, say, well, your religion is obviously ridiculous, you know, I wouldn't recommend that. But to your overall point, I don't think it's arrogant to say or to claim, no, I think this is the right religion. And now look at the other religions with both prudence and charity, and see them as to varying degrees, maybe approximating the fullness of one's own religion. I want to bring forth a couple of challenges that I saw in your AMA discussions yeah. to this idea that you have landed on the one true religion. The first challenge is what I might call the statistically unlikely challenge. And the second one is the birthplace challenge. Yeah. Let's take the first one. <laughs> okay. uh, critics sometimes will say, look, statistically, it's just highly, highly unlikely that you would land 
on the right religion. I'm quoting Wikipedia here, which says there are 4,300 different religions in the world today, and that that number rises to 10,000 if you account for all the different religions throughout history. So really, what are the chances that you would hit on the right religion among those 10,000 possibilities? Statistically, it's 0.01% chance that you randomly landed on that one. So do you think that you just got really lucky? <laughs> well, I, what's behind that that proposal is that I think of like this big container with the, you know, different uh, colored balls in it or something. And and there's only one, you know, that's the right color that you need to have to reach in there and hey, I, I was lucky enough to get it. Well, I mean, that, that completely removes religion from anything like a critical uh, analysis. Uh, that you can, to some degree, step back from the religion which you've received. And look, I'm sorry, that's just the way uh, life works. You know, I was born in Chicago, Illinois, which means I speak English with a particular uh, Midwestern twang. It means I had parents who, who gave me a particular form of education. So yeah, of course, everybody is is conditioned, you know, in some way. But that doesn't mean that at some point in my life, I didn't step back from the religion that I received and asked a lot of critical questions about it. In fact, I did. That's a big part of my own intellectual formation was asking a lot of serious questions about my religion and testing it thereby. You know, so the problem with, with the way the question is set up is that it just, it's... Uh, it's uh, counterfactual, uh, and it assumes that I can never find some kind of critical distance from my own uh, religion. Here's a, another criticism. You gestured at it just a moment ago. I, I call it the birthplace yeah. criticism. <laughs> Somebody will say, well, a person's religion is determined primarily by where they were born. For example, you think Christianity is true because you were born in America, in Chicago, as you just said, where it's the dominant religion. Mm -hmm. You were raised by Christian parents in a Christian culture. But if you had been born in India, you would probably think Hinduism is the one true religion. Or if you'd been born in Pakistan, it'd be Islam. Or if you'd been born in China, it'd be Buddhism. So it all seems pretty arbitrary. A person's religion seems determined by where they were born. Not determined. It, it begins there. I mean, and of course, that's what I say. Um, it's like shaking your fist at the clear blue sky. I mean, if you if you say, I should be born in some completely neutral setting where I have complete, you know, independence from all perspectives and make an utterly, you know, uh, unbiased judgment. Well, I mean, hello, welcome to fantasy. Or what do the British say? Cloud cuckoo land. I mean, no one... No one lives in that world. We we all come up out of a conditioned world to some degree. I'll give you an example. This is I had this talk the other day with uh, a big follower of the World Cup. As we record these words, the World Cup soccer, right? And man, they were so excited about it. And and so I'm listening, you know. And I said, yeah, I I, I know. I I just I can't get excited about the World Cup. And he looked at me like what? And I said, look, I I just think soccer is the most boring sport in the world to watch. I said, the, the field is too big. There's no action. They just seem to be wandering around. And, you know, if they get one goal, everyone gets excited. And so then I said to him right away, I said, look, I get it. I, I didn't grow up playing soccer. I don't really understand it. It's not my culture. And I, I said, I love baseball. And he said, oh, baseball, what a bore, you know. I said, I know. We, we came from different worlds. So I'm just acknowledging there. Of course, that's the way it goes. But see... Could we, that guy and I, could we step back from our formation and could I say, hey, here's why I love baseball. Let me explain it to you. And could he say, hey, here's why I think soccer is terrific. And I hope I'd have the open-mindedness to say, okay, let me you know, take that in and, and let's see and let's maybe argue about it. And so, I mean, yes, we're all conditioned by where we're from, but, but at a certain point, we can find a critical distance. Look at the writing of Thomas Aquinas. I mean, so here's someone who's obviously born completely and raised within a Catholic, you know, framework. But Thomas asks every possible question about his own religion and entertains the point of points of view from all across the philosophical and religious spectrum. And, you know, through God's grace, I, I was introduced to Thomas Aquinas as a very young man. And that had a huge impact on me. Uh so I don't think we're just stuck in our cultural conditioning and that we can never rise above that. Um, sure we can. Sure we can. 
Here's another response I saw on Reddit to this topic. People said, okay, look, you are convinced that Catholicism is the one true religion, and and let's grant that for a moment. However, other people seem to find deep fulfillment in their own religions too. If someone finds God or finds happiness through another religion, such as Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, why not just encourage them? Why not let them practice the religion that works best for them? Because it's not up to me, because the Lord Jesus Christ said, go and preach the gospel to all nations. So I'm under, I'm under a missionary command. Uh, I, I, sure, I can. if someone is finding joy and peace in their religion, I mean, great. I, I have nothing against that. But I've got an obligation to preach the gospel. And I do think the gospel is the fullness of life and joy, and I want to share that with everybody. So it doesn't mean I'm going to become this obnoxious, imperialistic um, jerk, you know, who's trying to impose my religion on everybody. So that's the caricature of our postmodern time. And anyone that claims that they have religious truth is ipso facto going to be uh, a bore. No, no, I, I hope I'd always do it in love. But it's not just up to me. I, I've, I've been commanded by the one that I claim is Lord to go and preach to all nations. He didn't say just preach to your own culture or preach to your you know, fellow believers or preach to people that you like. He said, preach to all nations. And if he is the Logos and not just one philosopher among many, well, of course everyone is meant to belong to him. If he's the Logos of God, you know, I mean, I mean, if there's a, there's a philosopher that I think is great, let's say I, you know, I like William James or I like Thomas Aquinas or fine, I'll share that with people, but I'm not under some some existential obligation to make everybody a, a, a strict Thomist. But I am under existential obligation to draw people toward the Logos. When the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all people to himself. Um, Paul, like a madman, is <laughs> racing around the Eastern Mediterranean. I'm just announcing the Lordship of Jesus. I, I want to go to Rome, and I want to go to Spain. And for Paul, that meant, I want to go to Timbuktu. I want to go to the end of the world to announce this. So that's the obligation I have as a, as a missionary. Um, and see, what I don't appreciate is when that is automatically interpreted as oppression. I, maybe we talked about this, Brandon, because it rings a bell as I'm looking at you now, that years ago in Chicago, and um, it was a Jewish-Christian dialogue, and Cardinal George was there. And he was talking about evangelization. And I had just been named by Cardinal George to do this work in evangelization. And one of the, the Jewish um, interlocutors got up and he said, you know, I just have to say it. When I hear the word evangelization, I think genocide. Well, I remember thinking, oh, come on. You, you know, that's so, uh, that's so unfair. Yes, this horrible history of anti-Semitism that culminated in the horrific genocide of Jews in the 20th century. But to say to a Christian, when I hear evangelization, I think Auschwitz or genocide, that's to take what's kind of most fundamental to my missionary identity and identify it with mass murder, you know? And so that's not helpful, I would suggest. Let's close with this question, and it, it kind of gets at what you were just wrapping up with, namely how to settle religious disputes, you know, mm -hmm. so people on Reddit would recognize, okay, Bishop Barron thinks he's got the one true religion. Other people I know think they have the one true religion. Therefore, how do we settle this other than by killing each other? Is it even possible to determine which religion is true or do we just have to agree to disagree? No, we talk to each other and, and we argue with each other. As I've been saying for years, arguing religion's a good thing. I agree with Stanley Hauerwas. We have to learn how to have arguments about religion in public. We forgot that art or we set it aside. And the result is, I've often said, either it's violence or bland toleration. And there is a very good middle ground, which is called religious argument. The, the model for which, in my judgment, is Thomas Aquinas, who had these marvelous, marvelous religious arguments, basically, in his great texts, where he allows all these voices to be heard. Thomas is a very contemporary figure that way, you know, all the stress on, you know, the many voices and let them be heard. Well, he does. He hears all kinds of voices, engages them, takes them seriously, respects their point of view, steel mans their argument, to use that term that I've learned to, to appreciate. Thomas is a beautiful example of that. He steel mans. He doesn't straw man. He steel mans the arguments of his opponents. 
And then he argues with them and comes to a resolution and then, then moves to the next question. That's a good way to do it. We can have good conversations and arguments about religion without killing each other. Well, it's time now for our question from one of our listeners. If you have a question for Bishop Barron, send it in to us at the website askbishopbarron.com. Today, we have a really interesting one from a young woman in Britain. She's a non-practicing Muslim who's been listening to Word on Fire, is attracted toward Catholicism, but wants your advice, Bishop, on what to do next. Here's her question. Hi, Bishop. I hope you're well. Um, I'm Leila. I live in Britain. And uh, I'm a non-practicing Muslim who's been enjoying your homilies, and I've been considering uh, converting to Christianity, especially Catholicism, but I'm scared. Um, I'm worried that I will lose my parents, and especially my mother, who's a devout Muslim, and I was wondering what your advice was. Uh, let me know, and thank you. Well, with that question, our discussion really uh, comes to, to a concrete expression, doesn't it? Uh, and thank you for the, the you know the courage the, the beauty of that of that question. You know, here's a first instinct is um, follow the promptings of grace. I mean, grace is is working in you. It seems to me, and if it's happening through you know my sermons or other sources, um, follow that grace. Here, here's my practical advice to you, though: find somebody, find a priest who is close to home. Uh, who knows you and knows your situation, with whom you can really talk and share the particulars. Because as you suggest in the question, I'm sure it's very complicated, uh, you know, given your family's background and your own background. I, and I'm just very reluctant because I don't know you and I, I don't want to give advice that wouldn't be helpful. But find somebody, find a priest, your parish priest um, near you that you can share this with, share your life with. and and. I think he'd be able to give you much better advice than I could. But um, in the meantime, pray. You pray, please. And I promise I'll pray for you too. And it's a, it's a difficult and important discernment that you're going through. Yeah, we'll all pray for you, Leela. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And all of us at Word on Fire, I'm sure, will keep you in prayer as well. Mm -hmm. Well, as we wrap up here, uh, another new book from Word on Fire. Seems like I say that every time we're together, Bishop Barron, but... <laughs> This time it is the second and final volume in our Word on Fire Vatican II collection. Mm -hmm. So many of you will remember that last year we released the first volume, which contained the four major constitutions of Vatican II, but there's actually 16 documents that came out of the Second Vatican Council. So this second volume includes the final 12 documents. Um, they're all declarations and decrees to give them the official title. You'll find the Church's teachings on education, religious freedom, evangelization, and much more. What's unique about our edition is that we take the texts of Vatican II and we surround them with commentary from not only Bishop Barron, but also the post-conciliar popes. So John Paul II, Benedict XVI, Pope Francis. So you're reading the council through the lens of the church. It's the best way to do it. Um, the book also has a foreword by Bishop Barron and an afterword by the esteemed theologian Matthew Levering and helpful appendices with key terms and figures and answers to frequently asked questions. So if you've been hearing about Vatican II, but you've never actually read the documents of Vatican II, pick up this second volume of our Word on Fire Vatican II collection. I'll include a link in the show notes. Well, thanks so much for watching and listening, and we'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Thank you.